get started by first going around and having us all very quickly introduce ourselves because we don't have a lot of time, but I really think it's important for us to uh, each other, each of us to know who's in the room with us. Uh, so we, welcome, Jill. And you can <laughs> you have a seat while you're while we're doing quick introductions, but. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome those who are from the Albany School of Pharmacy. Which are downstairs, there's, you'll see many, many white coats downstairs. Today is Pharmacy Day. Uh, it just happened that we were able to be looking at some of our agenda that uh, touches on these issues. Uh, but let's go around, and if you're here representing an organization or uh, engaged somehow to uh, follow this, these issues, if you please identify that, and let's just do a quickly name and go around. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, Good morning. Hi. Welcome. Good morning. Sorry. Hi, I'm Callie Fortin. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student and I'm on rotation with the OLC Kennedy Law Firm. Thank you. Welcome. Margaret Lagas. I'm a contract lobbyist with logistics uh, representing America's health insurance plans. Jim Fee with Perma Piper, also lobbyist representing CVS Health. This morning. Wayne Fisher with Orca Media. Bill Mazzucki with Labor and Public Affairs representing Milan. I'm Jasmine Lynn. I'm with Vermont uh, Department of Health in Burlington. I'm a for student of last year's student rotation. Welcome. James Warmer. I'm a, I run Woodstock Pharmacy and also the executive director of the Vermont Pharmacist Association. Susan Gretkowski, MVP Healthcare. Um, I am Priyanka Vitale. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student on rotation with Lisa at Diva. Jen Kennedy, I'm a lobbyist uh, and representing Cigna and Express. Okay. Jessica Barnard, the Executive Director of the Vermont Medical Society, representing physicians. Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Laura Pelosi at MMR Government Relations, here for Pharma. Sarah Ticho with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Nancy Hope, uh, Pharmacy Director for Vermont Medicaid. Uh, Brian Murphy, the Director of Pharmacy and Vendor Management of the Cross Blue of Vermont. Heather Schuldice, William Schuldice and Associates, here today on behalf of the Vermont Association of Chain Drug Stores. Uh, Jim Dandano, also with Kramer Pepper, Kramer, also on behalf of CBS. Becky Lewandowski with DRM for Pfizer. Good morning, I'm Theo Kennedy with Otis and Kennedy. I represent the Vermont Pharmacists Association and the Vermont Retail Druggists. Christina McLaughlin, <coughs> Green Mountain Care Board. Meredith Roberts, Executive Director of the American Nursing Association of Vermont. I'm Eric Siebert with Morris Government Affairs, representing the Association for Accessible Medicines. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to skip over our committee members introducing ourselves, although uh, we are publicly listed everywhere. So uh, it's up to date now. <laughs> It's up to date now. But yeah, it's, it's been updated. Yeah, that's updated as well. Uh, but because of time, uh, so we're happy to have us introduce ourselves at a later time. Uh, so yesterday we started to get updates on work that this committee and the legislature has done around uh, issues having to do with prescription drugs uh, in particular. And uh, we heard both an update about the initiative around possible importation of prescription drugs from Canada. We heard from Nashville, which is an organization which is working with multiple states doing that. Um, we, uh, and we heard uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield about some of the pressures that they're experiencing uh, as one of the major insurer for Vermonters and uh, heard of several, several bills that have been introduced in this biennium uh, that touch on prescription drug issues as well. This morning, I would like to welcome Jill Abrams from the Attorney General's Office, who has been working to follow and to implement an initiative on price transparency that this body uh, actually did several, several iterations of. Um, I'm hoping that uh, maybe in, in the, we have a brief time, uh, but uh, if you could briefly remind us and those who are gathered here what the uh, what the legislation laid out and asked and directed the uh, or asked the Attorney General's office to implement for us and then uh, maybe update us on where we are in the process. Uh, I know there's you've been working on it again this past year. So uh, given the time and we do need to be on the floor unfortunately uh, so uh, we'll, we'll go right up to the 930 hour. 
Uh, and uh, I'm guessing there may be other questions, and we'll have to return to this a little later time. Okay. Well, so, thank you. For the record, Jill Abrams, uh, Assistant Attorney General. Um, I brought copies of the report that I submitted. You may all already have them, but I've got copies. Well, there's electronic uh, ones that are posted, but if you would distribute those sure. for those who'd like a hard copy, I'm still in that world. Okay. Uh, and there may Me be too. others who have gathered around who would like a hard copy. Could I ask you to just yes. pass them? Yes. There, yeah. there are enough for the committee and then okay, some, well, some additional Can I check and well. see, Demis, can, while we're talking, can you check to see where we can access it online and post it on our website? Uh, well, if you need some assistance with that, we'll uh, maybe help you. And it's also accessible on the Attorney General's, Attorney General's website. website. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so um, just to sort of, a, I'll do a brief overview, and then I thought if it's okay with you, um, Chairman Lippert, I would sort of talk about some takeaways and some challenges. Yes, okay. absolutely. So, so um, big picture. Uh, the law, the original law, I believe was enacted in 2016, so we've had a little bit of experience. There have been some changes, and I, I, I would like to talk about the changes a little bit in the takeaway challenge part. But essentially, what the law does is it uh, directs DEVA, the Department of Vermont Health Access, and um, any insurer that insures over 5,000 lives in the state of uh, Vermont, which currently are Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont and MVP, um, to do some research into their own data and each come up with a, a different list. So DIVA is to come up with a list of 10 drugs to include at least one generic um, that has, the price of which has increased um, either over 15% in one year period or uh, over 50% in five year period. And DIVA is to submit that information both based on the wholesale acquisition cost or WAC um, or its net price, meaning net of rebates and other price concessions. So DIVA submits two separate lists. Um, the insurers um, also submit a similar kind of list, but based only on their net prices. And the statute gives some explanation about um, what, what sort of inquiry they should make, and, and the inquiries based on um, drugs that have a substantial impact on cost in Vermont, and which Vermonters would want to know more about. Um, so without going into the details, because I'm sure I can't describe how they actually do the data polls, but um, appended to my report as exhibits A and B are the DEVO WAC and net lists. Um, exhibit C is a really helpful memo that was done by DEVA that explained uh, the process that DEVA used to create the two lists. Um, and then exhibits C and D are the Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, respectively, um, lists of drugs um, that, that they selected. So I, I think the, the takeaway, at least from, from my perspective in creating the report, is that the prices for generics, for brands, and for specialty drugs are going up. So you know, unfortunately, not a big secret. Um, um, there is no overlap uh, between the drugs on the DIVA list and the insurer list, there's one overlap on the two insurer lists, but none with DIVA, either or, either WAC or NET. Um, the one drug that's common to MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield is a drug called Polazine, and it's a cystic fibrosis specialty drug. Um, Blue Cross reported an increase of 57.9% in that uh, drug price over five years, MVP reported 67% over one year. Um, each of the two insurers listed a generic per their statutory responsibility on their drug uh, list. Um, and, and just to pause for a second, and this is sort of a takeaway and a challenge, the, the law tried to, I think, be as forward thinking as possible and so allowed um, the entity making the list to either choose one year or five year as its yardstick. Um, so that's both 
helpful and a challenge because the two insurance companies each chose a different time period. So MVP is reporting for one year, Blue Cross Blue Shield for five years, well within the statutory right, but, but just different. And DIVA has a combination. In some instances, they reported both one and five years for the same drug, sometimes five, sometimes one. So there's a little bit of a challenge in trying to, to compare all of the information. Um, um, so with respect to the generics that Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP listed, Blue Cross Blue Shield reported a 98% increase over five years for that particular generic. MVP of 44.6% over one year. So again, you know, sizable increases. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield's list was all specialty drugs except for the one statutorily required generic drug. Um, and it reported a range increase over five years of 57.9% to 103%. Uh, MVP listed two specialty drugs, again used a one year period, its range of increase was 21.4 to 67% on the one year basis. So that's sort of big picture, prices are increasing. Um, some challenges that we faced um, is that, as I understand it, and, and, and the insurers are far better at explaining this than I am, but, but as I understand it, based on conversations we've had over the last year and then a conversation I had with um, the two insurers yesterday, um, there are a lot of different ways, as I understand it, you could pull the data. And again, I think that the, um, the, the, the statute tried to give some leeway um, I think in giving leeway, it may have created some, some potential um, difficulties as well. But again, I'm not the right person to speak to that. But it took several tries before the insurers, and, and they worked really hard and really long over a lot of months. But it took a while um, before they were both satisfied with their lists and were satisfied that they were pulling the data in essentially the same way, and you know, Brian Murphy is here, and, and maybe he can speak better to it than I. But um, when we talked yesterday, um, my understanding of what the insurers were saying is that they think they may be able to come up with something that would give us even better data. Um, and so yeah, obviously that's, that's the, the committee's decision to make, but but that is part of what we're wanting, both yeah. to hear the results of the report but and also to hear any recommendations for yeah. how to strengthen uh, what we put in place or streamline it if it's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what that mechanism is. I don't know that they, they do either, but it was clear from the conversation that there, there may be some ways that they could provide us with information that would be helpful to the committee. And uh, you know maybe the committee would give them some direction about what the committee would like to see. Um, so um, another challenge that was faced is that um, DIVA's actual net cost for its drugs under federal statute can't be disclosed, even to the AG's office under our, our uh, confidential, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our confidentiality provision as it, as it is in the statute. So again, trying to select a list of drugs and try and compare apples to apples was made a more complicated as a result of that. Um, so, um, and I don't, and, and I know Nancy Hogue is here and she is the expert on this stuff, not I, but um, she explained to me that in addition to, to that fact, the, um, the drugs and the population served by the uh, insurers and DIVA may be somewhat different, and that may be another reason that there's not the sort of overlap that we might have expected to see. But again, better left to, to Nancy than, than to me. Um, so as a result, it, the, the AG's office was really challenged with, with trying to find a list of 15 drugs under the statute in the way that the um, committee had envisioned. And um, so I think we're, we're actually looking for some guidance too 
and, and hoping for probably not today, but, but some more thinking about the statute. Um, we feel like um, the report as it's gone out has certainly generated questions and inquiries from, um, from colleagues across the country. Um, Vermont was the first one to put a law like this into place. Other states have followed. Um, from, from the um, statutes that I've reviewed, um, they're all different. And so I think, as I understand, what, what Mashby is trying to do is to sort of come up with some sort of a model legislation for people to use, incorporate whatever a particular state wants, but try and have reporting where you can sort of compare on an apples to apples basis. Um, so, um, and, and some, of the, some of the statutes that have been um, enacted in other states have been met with legal challenges. Um, I think we did a really good job in Vermont at identifying potential legal challenges and avoiding them. We built in the um, public, non-public versions of the report and that sort of thing. Um, so those are the kinds of challenges that have been faced elsewhere. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So there really, as I'm remembering, there were two parts of this, which was establishing a list to, to look at the increases. I mean, the, the context of this, of course, is that there, there's been, you know, significant increases, uh, which, again, we had lots of anecdotes, but we said that we want to see uh, what the data shows. And so uh, that's what you've been describing. And then we also were asking manufacturers to provide uh, information that explained uh, or justified the increases because our testimony in past years has, uh, well, shall we say it's not been clear uh, what really uh, attribute to, to attribute the uh, drug increases uh, and that so is there anything that you have, I mean, in, pa in years past, you said you know, some of, much of that information could not be shared uh, because of proprietary issues. Is there anything that, uh, is there anything new on that front? No, I don't think so. Um, and, and just to be clear, this year's report doesn't include a list of manufacturers and their information because of the challenges we faced with this iteration of the law. Um, and um, in a conversation, I was uh, contacted by folks on the Senate side um, in the fall asking about you know, sort of what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I explained some of the challenges and their suggestion for this year was to raise the challenges to submit the report in a, in a broader way to sort of identify those challenges in a hope that for the next iteration of the report we could address some of those and incorporate them so that we could do the kind of, of uh, presentation that might be a little more granular. So I, this committee is very interested in these issues still um, and there is a challenge with being the first to put something forward, um, we've tried to revise it uh, somewhat, and uh, I would I would like appreciate our legislative council, Jim Carvey, being here. Um, my personal hope is that we can work with uh, Nashby, who we heard from yesterday, but we can hear from again, specific to this, um, to see to to understand how we might strengthen what we're doing in Vermont. Uh, in coordination with other states who, who have followed and, and some of them have passed, as I understand, enhanced laws that go beyond what what we've done for Vermont. But we'll not put Jen on the spot at this point to ask her to explain those differences for us right now. But that is certainly one of my hopes as the chair, to both get feedback from you, to hear from the insurers who uh, and Diva, who we have scheduled later this morning, and then to, uh, well, to, to visit the question of, is this, is, is what we intended here, producing uh, information that's of value? Uh, I, I don't, 
as a chair, want us to go through an exercise that simply puts us through an exercise but doesn't provide value uh, because I know it's valuable time on your part and everyone's part. On the other hand, uh, my experience of, over time with this and other issues is that sometimes the initial work, uh, it takes some time to uh, sort out what it is that you need to most appropriately uh, try to achieve and how to achieve it. So uh, I'm not, I guess I'm not signaling at this point that we're going to uh, leave the field of trying to uh, <coughs> gather further information around this. But let me open it up to questions from committee members at this point and uh, see if there's any other questions came up. Right. Just a question of a clarification. You were, um, I didn't quite get the full sentence of what you were saying about um, the confidentiality and publicly sharing. Is that the proprietary information you said yes. that you can't? Or okay. you also mentioned Diva Net. Diva. Okay, so there were two. I'm sorry, I was talking like the FedEx man, I think, trying to <laughs> get it all in. Um, yeah, so confidentiality comes up in a couple of different ways, a few different ways. So I think the first thing I was talking about was um, under federal law, um, a Medicaid agency isn't permitted to disclose on a per product basis their net cost. So. Um, Diva can't tell us that it pays X dollars per pill for a given drug. Um, they can tell us the WAC cost, the wholesale acquisition cost. Okay. Yeah, which is, which is sort of like, um, I always I think of it as a parallel to the MSRP for a car, you know, sort of what you see on the sticker, but after, after some conversation, usually you don't, you don't pay that price. And um, with drugs, um, particularly if you're a, a large purchaser, um, you get rebates and other kinds of price concessions which will bring your price down. So our Medicaid agency um, receives rebates and concessions as a result of being a Medicaid agency and they also be able to, to negotiate some supplemental rebates. So if the wholesale price is you know, $40, Diva might be paying $20, but they're not allowed to disclose that under federal law, the $20. They can damage. disclose the WAC, but not the, exactly. the real. Yeah. Okay. And then the, <clears throat> I think the other confidential Excellent. mention I made was um, the way the statute is written, there are certain public information that we can provide. So the priceless, um, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the drug lists that are created by Diva and the insurers um, are posted both on our website and on the Green Mountain Care Board website. Um, with respect to the insurers, there is a non-public version because that version does show the net prices paid by the insurers. Um, and again, that, that's a way of not disclosing what they're negotiating with the manufacturers. The manufacturers consider that sort of information to be trade secret. Um, and so, um, so that information isn't, isn't disclosed. Um, I think those are the two main mentions. Thank you. Should yeah. I help? Sure. Uh, I was just confirming with legislative council because what, what I'm remembering is that, in fact, uh, Diva, I believe, and Nancy's here, but we'll hear from you more later, but I think Diva has in the past been able to share with us what their aggregate savings are. Uh, I believe in terms of the negotiated um, savings, uh, but not the granular <coughs> individual drug savings uh, that are negotiated. And they're substantial. Um, so it's important for us to have a, a sense of that. Um, other committee member questions? Okay. Let, let me, uh, is there any, anything any final comment that you'd like to make? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me uh, emphasize again that this, the, the issues of prescription drug pricing uh, increases, uh, and from testimony that we've taken in the past, both around issues, it's, it's, it's around, there have been some egregious, from our point of view, egregious increases, both in the generic <coughs> uh, as well as in the brand name 
as well as now in special specialty drugs, which are increasingly based on the data we're seeing, where the incre incredible increases in prices and the incredible prices, coupled sometimes with incredible outcomes as well. So you know, acknowledging that, but nevertheless, increases uh, which really have made uh, are driving a large portion or a significant portion of our healthcare costs. Uh, not just in Vermont, obviously, but clearly for Vermonters. Uh, so, I guess I'll just say for myself as the chair of this committee, and I think it's shared by many of our committee members, we intend to continue to press forward with trying to find every avenue that we can at a state level to be uh, aggressive about trying to reduce uh, unjustified or maybe unjustified to, to judgmental work to, to make prescription drugs as affordable to Vermonters as possible uh, and to understand and to intervene where we can to influence that. Uh, we, there are limits to what we can do as a state, but we also heard, as we heard from Nashville, that much of the activity is happening at the state level. The initiatives are happening at states, uh, not just Vermont, but other states as well. And so. Uh, I think we, along with our, our colleagues in the Senate, who uh, different initiatives have come from the House and the Senate, um, uh, intend to continue to press forward uh, with this very important issue. And it's, and it's not a partisan issue. I fair to say this is an issue in this committee that has, strong, has had strong support from every political part of the spectrum. Uh, in fact, when we passed out a number of our bills, uh, they came out with uh, very strong support across the across the entirety of the political views, uh, often fully represented in our committee. So uh, this this is not an issue of partisan politics. This is an issue of uh, working on behalf of Vermonters around prescription drugs. And while I'm doing an editorial, I'll just say that those of you who are working in the field of pharmacy, we're not uh, we, we're we're also struggling to understand how how you are in the midst of, of this chain of uh, uh, price increases and availability and uh, trying to understand all the, the complexity of this system uh, and how much of it is and where there are black boxes that we can't get inside of in order to understand or how to help both understand, explain, and then possibly intervene. Very frustrating uh, times. Uh, but again, I think there's a strong consensus that we will do our best to try to continue to move forward. So we'll, I appreciate your uh, joining us this morning, and we will take some of the concerns that you've laid out here, and uh, along with other testimony, and perhaps be bringing a revised uh, set of recommendations to <laughs> make it more possible. I just one thing I did want to say is that um, in, in in doing this work um, and in connection with other pharma work that I do, um, the Vermont legislature is often um, commented on or complimented for being the first one out of the box. So I just wanted you to know that because I work with people all over the, the country and what what we do. Is, is the subject of a lot of discussion everywhere. Well, I appreciate that. And we'll keep pressing forward. Thank you. So we'll go to the floor at this point. Uh, we are scheduled to hear from uh, both uh, Brian Murphy from Crossroads Shields and Nancy Ho after the floor. Okay, um, let me start with uh, apologies, but uh, it is the nature of this building that one never knows um, what's happening on the floor and for how long. And I was, uh, I and a number of other chairs well, were completely wrong in our sense of what the debate would be and the amount of time it would take. But it is also an essential part of our work. 
So I have spoken with Brian Murphy from Blue Cross Blue Shield and Nancy Pope from Diva, who were our first to be our first witnesses. They have agreed to come back at another time. Uh, it is generally our practice when there are folks, witnesses who have come a distance and who are not regularly available in the building to hear from them, give priority. So I'm going to uh, ask us, uh, so, and, and because there are so few seats, uh, Brian, who was going to stay and listen, said, I'll have to come back. <laughs> so they, they, they've left. Uh, but I'd like to start, and uh, I'd like to hear from <coughs> Lauren, uh, I'm going to Bodhi, or Bodhi, Bodhi uh, from Sandra Rosa, and from Jeff Hochberg. And we have really just between now and noon. So if you could be thinking about how to apportion your time so that we could hear from each of you. Uh, we'll probably have minimal time for questions from the committee, but we do want to hear your testimony and uh, welcome you. So let's start by having Lauren join us at the witness chair. And as is uh, our practice in the legislature, is recorded testimony, so we ask for witnesses to identify themselves by name and affiliation, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Uh, so as you said, my name is Dr. Lauren Bodie. I am assistant professor at Albany College of Pharmacy here in Colchester. Um, I have a couple other roles that I think are germane today. I am also a pharmacist clinician with the University of Vermont Department of Family Medicine, practicing at one of their clinics in Milton, Vermont. Um, and I'm also here with the Vermont Pharmacists Association. Um, and I can tell you, you know, first off, I want to say how much I appreciate the um, the time to be able to address you, in particular it being Pharmacist Day here in Montpelier. Um, but this is, uh, what we're talking about today is very important to me on a couple different levels. So um, I am coming into this with a, um, what I think is a somewhat unique or rare perspective of someone who is a pharmacist, who has practiced in community pharmacy, but I currently work in a primary care clinic. Um, both pharmacy and primary care are things that I um, hold in the, um, of the highest importance. And what I really like about this initiative, of that of um, granting some limited, limited prescriptive authority to pharmacists, is that I think it can be good for both. Um, good for pharmacy in Vermont, good for primary care in Vermont, but most importantly, good for Vermonters. Um, so this is, so to start off, you know, this is a initiative that um, other jurisdictions, states, and both our neighbors to the north in Canada have been pursuing for many years, um, that of granting some appropriately limited prescribing authority um, to pharmacists. Um, and what they, are, um, what they are seeing is some positive results. Um, I think this is understandable because we've seen in many venues that when pharmacists are getting more closely involved with the healthcare team, more centrally located um, in the continuum of the patient's care, you see three major things happen. Um, one is that the quality of care improves. Um, so whether this is by assessing um, patients meeting their blood pressure targets, um, more A1Cs coming into goal, a marker of diabetes control, um, or just overall like adherence to medications. The pharmacists support these initiatives. Um, the other is that um, care tends to cost less. Um, this is almost a corollary of that first point because healthier people cost the system less. Um, and then the second and the third is that patients are um, more satisfied with their care. And, um, and so for these reasons, I would anticipate that in Vermont, we would see these same sort of results that we have seen in these other states um, and territories of Canada um, in, during, like, in those times that they have expanded um, pharmacists' ability to provide care um, that's within the scope of their education and training. Um, so there are um, a few aspects that I think would be particularly helpful for Vermont to kind of create some examples for how this may um, this could play out in the state as it has in other places. Um, so one of them is being for a pharmacist to be able to prescribe medications for tobacco cessation. So nearly one in five Vermonters um, currently smokes today. Um, this is a huge public health burden um, with its attendant costs of heart disease, lung disease, and cancer that comes with. Um, we also know that patients who have healthcare provider support, a pharmacist included, we have the studies that show that pharmacists are highly effective um, in helping patients stop smoking or using tobacco. 
um, can be really important for helping be, patients be successful in their efforts. Um, but what we also know is that there are currently barriers to access to these prescription medications because there are barriers to access to care in our state. Um, and what was particularly um, interesting is that just last week in a major report that came out from the Surgeon General, the Surgeon General specifically called out pharmacists' ability to prescribe tobacco cessation medications as a potential avenue for closing this like public health gap that we see. Um, so that's one area that I think could be particularly helpful to the state. Um, another would be um, giving pharmacists the ability to prescribe hormonal contraception. So nearly half of pregnancies are unplanned. Um, so again, another public health issue because when you have unplanned pregnancies, that's a lack of access to care um, and potentially compromising um, both health and economic outcomes for mother and baby in the early years. Um, what we have, what we know is that hormonal contraception is a preferred method of contraception by many women. Um, but we also know from a national survey that nearly 30% of women who wish to go on hormonal contraception encounter problems getting it. Um, 20 per, and the most common being um, lack of access to a, a clinic or primary care provider or other prescribing provider who can provide that um, either initial or refill prescription for the hormonal contraception. Um, this is something that has been rolled out in many places to a significant degree. For example, in Oregon, 10% um, of hormonal contraception is prescribed by a pharmacist at this point. Um, the, the other thing that I think is notable about this is that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who is very active on this issue, they too have promoted um, the expanded role of pharmacists to be able to provide um, hormonal contraception. Um, but even they say, even maybe even that's not far enough, it should be um, over the counter potentially. Um, so while that would be a bit of a uh, paradigm shift for us, something that you know, can be a very um, actionable middle ground would be giving pharmacists the ability to assess the patient and then prescribe that hormonal contraception when appropriate. And the last thing are sort of a bundle of issues about access to timely care and streamlining a um, what can be a really convoluted healthcare process for many patients. And these are things like giving pharmacists the ability to prescribe pen needles when an injectable medication is prescribed. You can't use the injectable medication without the pen needle. And if a prescriber, if another provider forgets to send in that prescription, that very often results in a delay of care for that patient that may prove a potentially insurmountable barrier depending on what else is going on with that patient. Um, the same could be said for um, testing for diabetes or testing supplies for diabetes, um, nebulization supplies, a spacer for inhalers. Um, things where there has already been a therapeutic decision on the part of another provider to, pro to use this therapy in this patient, but haven't as, but may have forgotten in the overburdened primary care system to um, prescribe some of these like ancillary items that are necessary to get the full benefit of those medications. In our current system, the pharmacist has to call back to the provider's office, say, hey, we need this. Um, this is burden in the pharmacy, more importantly, burden in the healthcare provider's office that, um, to my mind, could very reasonably be done by the pharmacist at the point of dispensing to ensure that the patient has timely access to care, that we're not cluttering up the physician's um, you know, voicemail and in-basket with something that is fully within our capability of um, like addressing for ourselves. We just need the ability, like the legal ability, to actually do so. Um, so this is kind of a general overview of the ways that we believe that um, this initiative could benefit the health of Vermonters. Um, I would love at this point um, to turn it over to my colleague Sandy Rosa um, to talk about the ways in which the contemporary pharmacy education is um, preparing pharmacists of today to um, fill this role and meet this challenge. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a hard act to follow. <laughs> 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 
Hello, my name is Sandra Rosa. I'm a licensed pharmacist in the state of Vermont. I am the president of the uh, Vermont Pharmacists Association. I am also the director of pharmacy practice experience at the College of Pharmacy in Colchester. I want to discuss with you how we are preparing our students to meet these challenges to be able to practice at the top of their practice, scope of their practice. Yes, that's me. Oh no, I have this. That's good. Um, since 2006, the Doctor of Pharmacy degree has been the terminal degree for the profession, and the education has risen to the doctoral level, incorporating the clinical training seen in the education of other health professionals. The basic core cor courses teach the systems of the body and what can go wrong, in such as immunology, immunology pathology, biochemistry, and that. From there, the students progress to classes on how medications are formulated, their mechanism of action, side effects, interaction to each other, and how genetic variations can influence drug action. And this is something called pharmacogenomics. Um, then, putting this all together, there's an awful lot going on. Um, they're giving courses on the various body systems and how drugs affect each one um, in respiratory and cardiology and every body system that there is available. Um, in addition, students are trained in over-the-counter medications in how their indications are and when to refer patients to other providers. We're not out there to sell the ibuprofen when we feel that the pain is more than we can, that can be handled. Um, throughout the entire curriculum, students are educated in problem solving using case studies to illustrate the proper medication management in varied conditions. Using a template called the pharmacist patient care process, for patient assessment and treatment allows the students to gather information, assess areas for gaps in treatment, develop a medication plan, implement the plan in collaboration with the other healthcare providers, and provide follow-up by measuring adherence and outcomes. Interpreting scientific literature and updated guidelines is also taught so that the students know where to find evidence-based therapy for treatment of patients. Skills such as compounding, sterile and non-sterile technique, reading patient charts and assessment skills, such as taking blood pressures, um, uh, doing uh, diabetes testing, and clear wavering, um, are taught throughout the entire curriculum. There are soft skills involved, such as patient counseling and education, and they're taught using simulated patients, usually from the University of Vermont, and thank you for that. Um, courses in ethics, um, HIPAA, law, healthcare systems, and administration provide the student the understanding of the pharmacy working world and the importance of the high ethical standards that both the profession and the public hold us to. Professionalism is taught from the very beginning at orientation and continues throughout the entire curriculum. In addition to the scientific and clinical courses, all students are nationally immunized by, and certified by the American Pharmacists Association and our CPR and basic life support is certified. We also provide other certifications in medication therapy management and tobacco cessation. Finally, all the coursework comes together in their final year where they complete seven six-week rotations in hospitals, clinics, community pharmacies, and other pharmacy-related situations such as Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, um, Department of Health, and things like that, long-term care, mail order pharmacy, to develop further their clinical reasoning under the direction of experienced practitioners. Admission to pharmacy school is not only resting on good grades, but with an interview process to assess their empathy and problem-solving skills. Throughout the years in school, students extend themselves into the community in various outreach endeavors in senior centers, schools, the Ronald McDonald House, Hope Lodge, the Lung Walk, Relay for Life, and things like that. I am fully confident that students graduating from the Doctor of Pharmacy program are fully qualified to address the unmet medical needs of the med Vermont citizenry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I say briefly that um, I find some of what's been presented here compelling, and uh, we'll have we no time to have committee discussion right now. Uh, I'm not aware that all of what's been described in terms of um, prescribing authority for pharmacists is in front of us in a in a proposal uh, in a bill form, but we have the ability to create uh, legislation as a committee bill or incorporate this into other 
proposals which may be in front of us. So I would invite, and I'm, I'm sorry our legislative council isn't able to be in the room to have heard this testimony, but I would uh, invite you to uh, continue to be in touch as we hear, uh, as we look at the possibility of moving some of your proposal or all of your proposals forward. Thank you, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Now, let me check in with uh, Mr. Hartford and his line. I welcome you to briefly share, or I also welcome the possibility, or include the possibility of having you uh, return at a later time. I know that this is not the uh, um, presentation that you probably anticipated. There is absolutely no way we could even begin to discuss privacy <laughs> right. in 10 minutes. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah, so, so, uh, absolutely, I'd love to come back and, and um, we can Maybe at the same it. time Nancy Hogue and Brian absolutely. Murphy are available. Sure. We, and I realize you've traveled a distance, but um, yep. I, I think that I'm might be the possible. better. I mean, having heard yeah. sure. the testimony we just heard and then realizing that we can't really begin to touch on what you right. want to share. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll just, and I do have some copies if anyone needs of the slides, but they are online too, and I think they speak for themselves. Um, you say, wait, identify yourself for the record. They so, yeah, say a so, few words, and then we'll have you back yeah. again. So my name is Jeff Hockford. I'm the acting president of the Vermont Retail Druggist. Um, and what we, what I'm here today to talk about prescription pricing is, is first I want to applaud this committee for really taking this, this up. Uh, this is a very complex, very dynamic. It changes from minute to minute as to what's going on. Um, and it takes a long time um, to really grasp it and all the inner working of, of pharmacy pricing. Um, and I know you were read uh, H785 uh, from Representative Sarah Copeland Hans's yesterday, I believe. Yes, we did. Um, and it's a great, great opportunity. Um, I, I mentioned I'm also on the National Committee for the National uh, Community Pharmacy Association of their State Legislation Council. Um, rate setting is something that is being talked at a national level, and it's, it's, it is one key component. And um, what I really wanted to share is that with that, with importation, I know there's a 340B bill out there, um, and um, Actually, a 340. I'm not aware of a 340D bill. I thought I saw it. Maybe it's on the Senate side. Maybe it's on the Senate side. Maybe on the Senate side. We, we, well, we should make sure we see that. Because, um, uh, wholesale you know, uh, importation from Canada, uh, expanding the scope of, of uh, our licensed professionals uh, so that they can better determine and, and improve access. Uh, these are all key components to this. And what, and even uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield's notion of, of investing in a manufacturer, a not-for-profit manufacturer, who would have heard such a thing. Uh, it's great. This is all, these are all great initiatives, and they, and they all need support. But I think what, they, what we need to do is we need to consider our perspective. And if you go... Power uh, means... Power, by hour, would you power say? I mean the state, any yeah, regulatory body, legislature. Yeah. Um, this is one model that I have about the flow of, of drug pricing and how it's interrelated with some of the major players, but there's, it's so much more complex than this. And I know Brian's slide has one with, it's just a spider web. Um, and that's, that's the problem. No matter what initiative we, we go down, I'm not sure that we could ever fully evaluate it or be able to fully predict what might happen. And I think there's an opportunity with a combination of what's in front of you on H785 with a rate review establishment body, coupled with some kind of perspective. And I'm here to tell you that there is one player in the entire chain that sees absolutely everything, and that is the wholesale. I can literally log in on this computer right here and on a dashboard, see everything that's going on in my pharmacy from my acquisition costs, my third party reimbursements, projected DIR fees from Medicare, which I won't even get into. Um, I have access to 340B pricing. I have various wholesaler pricing. I see everything there is. And that wholesaler captures it all. 
They can capture every bit of data that I have. Every claim that I transmit, they capture. They know how much I'm being reimbursed, and they certainly know how much it costs me. What if the state had eyes like that? We could then position ourselves to fully evaluate and dive into every one of the great ideas that's been put in front of this committee and others. It allows for the importation process to happen because you need a wholesaler anyway. It gives eyes into 340B as to whether or not the supplemental rebates, which are entirely proprietary, are of greater benefit than the 340B price. All of those things intermingle to that. And if you, with rate setting and with potential switching to something, a great model like our Medicaid system has as a fee for service model, we could streamline the pathway and eliminate the pharmacist's burden of pay for product. They could be paid for service they provide, and it could allow them the opportunity to expand to greater steps and, and uh, prescriptive authority or, or other things that are allowed under their licensure. We could fully access our healthcare professionals and improve access, because that's the number one thing. Prices are going up, access is going down, and we don't necessarily know how to evaluate the prices that are in there. Our perspective is getting more and more clouded, and that's what we need. We need perspective. And I'd love to dive in more, but I really don't want to take any more yep. time. So. You have successfully piqued our interest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, Lucy? Um, can you, sorry, can you just, going back to the very beginning, clarify who you're representing and what kind of perspective sure. within this? So I am I am the president web. of the Vermont Retail Druggists. Uh, yeah. So we're a, a, a body of pharmacy ownership. Okay. Um, and um, this, what, I'm sorry, the second part of your question earlier. Really. Um, that was pretty much my question, yeah. just what piece of the web of... <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I personally, I also oper operate as a director and owner of several pharmacies in Southern Vermont, and I also serve on the National uh, Community Pharmacy Association State Legislative Council. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, and we will work to uh, bring you, <laughs> as well as uh, the other witnesses who we... Uh, Nancy Hogue and uh, Brian Murphy uh, back at another time. Uh, we're not sure it'll be next week because we've already had to anticipate that and do some scheduling, but we'll, we'll work together and with Demis Martin, our committee assistant, to find a time to hear from you again before long. I'd be happy to come back anytime. Like I said, Great. it's complex. Okay, it, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, and let, let me also just say again, uh, thank you to those who are here from the Albany College of Pharmacy. Uh, we we're fortunate in Vermont to have you in Vermont as a new educational resource and a resource to the state generally. And so uh, we're, I'm pleased that you're here today and uh, welcome you to continue to develop a relationship at the policy level with uh, those, the Vermont Legislature and the House Health Care Committee. And right. also with us are my colleagues from University of Vermont Medical Center. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was, I was, you were introduced on the floor, but uh, it, it, I, I guess I just emphasize that uh, we're going to be hearing from residents uh, from the OBGYN uh, program who are residents with Dr. Till. It's, it's very... Uh, it, it becomes very powerful to actually weave training and experience, practical experience, and training settings with uh, us as policy makers. Uh, we can cite numerous examples where, and this may be one today, where uh, there's a proposal put forward based on some very practical experience, and it leads to uh, policy change at the state level. So I welcome each of you to continue to not just do your professional training, but to think about how to interface with us as policymakers along the way. It's actually very important to us and ultimately to Vermonters. So, thank you. Let's stop. Uh, thank you. We made the best of a hard situation. Uh, we'll move forward.